Again, thank you for the effort, because I think it's very difficult to get here today, and so great to have you. We are so pleased to have you online. That online streaming turns out to be a great blessing for an awful lot of our homes. We've been looking at those feasts. This is the last, the last Sunday of Advent, and this will be the last feast we look at. But in the Old Testament, God was very careful to give a written record, kind of a picture of the Messiah that was coming, and he did that by the feasts. They would celebrate Jesus who was coming. Jesus fulfilled those feasts. Helps us to understand exactly who he is. And as we understand more and more about those feasts, we have this renewed passion for Jesus who was born in Bethlehem of the Virgin Mary. Those feasts are actually the root of our faith. The Old Testament is not just unrelated old stories. There's a master theme being gone through the whole, the whole story. A master theme going through the Old Testament, getting ready for the New Testament. That God will enter into a blood covenant through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is not an old book. It's the living word of God. It tells that story about the Messiah who's coming. The greatest old phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, that was, that's what God was doing. He was giving a visual aid in those feasts, a picture. We, we get things through our physical senses a lot faster than, than our spiritual senses. As they observe those feasts, year after year after year, they more and more understood who Jesus was. The Old Testament feasts point the way to the New Testament. That's why we don't do them anymore. They, they point the way to Jesus coming. Well, he came. Jesus gave us, of course, the new feast of communion, remembering what he's done. But the more we get these feasts, the more everything pops. Certain scriptural verses begin to come alive in the context of the feast. Today, the last of the major feasts, the Feast of the Tabernacle. Now, i got to go back last week real quick. Feast of the Trumpets and Feast of the Tabernacle overlap a little bit. Kind of like unleavened bread and Passover under, uh, uh, overlapped, going all the way back to the beginning of Advent. Trumpets overlap a little bit with this one, Feast of the Tabernacles, because it's in the fall. It, it celebrates the harvest completed, another year completed. But the Tabernacles was this gigantic celebration, one of my, famous, one of my favorite quotes. A rabbi said, a person who's never been to Jerusalem during Feast of the Tabernacles doesn't know what rejoicing is. If you've never been to Jerusalem on Feast of the Tabernacles, you don't know what rejoicing is. This wraps up all the year. I mean, the fall of the year, married to Feast of Trumpets. This wraps up the year. It is a huge celebration. Now, just as a sidelight, I've, I've walked you through four major feasts during Advent. There's actually seven. Seven is, of course... Uh, represents the number of completions. So there's a couple of other feasts we haven't touched on, but here's the four major ones. The Feast of Tabernacles, a celebration, a finished work in our lives. The year is done, the harvest is done, the finished work of God in our lives through Christ. They celebrated and now they earn the rest. This doesn't mean, well, I can rest. I brought Christ into my life. I guess I can just, it's all finished. I can coast. No, we continue to grow. We continue to mature. We press toward the mark that God has given to us at the same time we rest. Gene, that makes no sense whatsoever. Press and rest. You get the tension, don't you? Paul totally got this tension. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Look what Paul wrote. I do not mean that I am already as God wants me to be. Well, none of us are. Come on. I have not reached that goal, but I continue trying to reach it pressing on to make it mine. Christ wants me to do that which is the reason he made me his. He's got things for me. I gotta keep pressing on. So he's talking about pressing on. Yet in the very same letter to Philippians, look what he wrote one chapter letter, Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content to rest in Christ. It's amazing. He says, he says them both. I'm pressing towards what God has for me. I, I am pressing. I'm working. I'm stretching. I'm growing. I'm maturing. I'm resting. There is a little bit of tension there. He's pressing toward the mark, realizing what God has for him and being content in what God has done in his life, being content in Christ. He rests in Christ, but continues to press forward. That in a nutshell is the celebration of Feast of the Tabernacle. Their year is complete. We can rest. The harvest is in. And with every one of those feasts, 
it begins to realize the historical start. Where did this thing start? When God came to Moses and said, I want you to do this. Once we get that, it helps us understand the entire feast. And that helps us understand who Jesus is. So we have the Feast of Tabernacles, be like all the rest, go back to Leviticus. When God comes to Moses and says, here's what I want you to do. Leviticus 23, 33 to 36. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Speak to the children of Israel saying, the 15th day of the seventh month. Again, we got a lot of dates going on here. Shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. Here it is. For seven days to the Lord, on the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days, you'll offer the offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now, he gives this instruction, which is kind of mind-boggling. He's going to come back beginning on the eighth day, finishing on the 15th and all this stuff. He's going to get more on that 15th day. Just a few verses later, I want you to see it, Leviticus 23, 39 to 43. A little bit longer. Also, he's still talking about Feast of Tabernacles. I'm going to, bring, I'm going to make sense out of all this. Hang with me. Also, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest. On the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruits of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, keep that in your head, palm trees, the bow of leafy trees, willows of the brook, and you shall receive before the, rejoice before the Lord for seven days. So we're rejoicing for seven days. That's a pretty good party. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days that year. There shall be a, sta a statute forever for your generations. You shall dwell in booths, keep that in your head also, for seven days. Okay, we've got to break all that down. There's so much there, it's almost, you know, duh. Seven days, we're going to party. From the, from the convocation on day one to convocation on day eight, get down, get funky. Time for a party. They begin on the 15th and on the 21st, seven days. And remember, if you haven't been here, you're going, whoa, whoa, Gene, that's six days. We count the first days, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So we're dealing with seven days. On the seventh month, seven means completion. Remember, there's a grand total of seven feasts. Seven days, seventh month, the seventh month of the Jewish calendar remembers Tishbri. On that 22nd of that day, the eighth day of this whole deal, there's a special Sabbath, a resting with even more rejoicing. I love resting with, joy, with rejoicing. That's New Year's Day with all the football games. Feast the tabernacle. It's a grand celebration of all that God has done, looking back at our past, looking forward to our future, and it's got that past and future piece of the puzzle. First, I want to take you back. It reminds them 40 years they wandered. They lived in shelters during those 40 years or tabernacles during those 40 days. They were to be reminded of their wanderings of their forefathers because of their disobedience, but they were praising God. Their wandering was only temporary. And even during their wanderings, God met all their needs, eventually bringing them to the land of rest that had been promised to them. And as a constant reminder, during these seven days, they were to build booths. Remember we read that? Shelters. They were to build temporary shelters, and that's where they were going to live those seven days. Yeah, it gets wild. That reminding them that we wanted for 40 years constantly building temporary shelters. So every year, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Hebrews would gather the necessary wood, branches, or whatever to build this little shelter to live in for that seven days of celebration. In fact, in parts of the Holy Land, even today, they, they do this as part of the ongoing celebration of the Feast of the Tabernacles. So it looks back. We lived in, we lived in tabernacles, little itty bitty buildings. We lived in shelters as we moved those 40 years. It reminds us as every year we got to build these things again. It also looks forward. They were to make sure as they built these little, little shelters, tabernacles, whatever, that there was a hole at the top. That when they would lay down, they had to look to the heaven. It reminded them we're pilgrims passing through this life. They were pilgrims going from A to B here. We're pilgrims on this life. And there's a city being built for us. We're nothing more than living in tabernacles here on earth. And we celebrate eternity. God has a greater rest for us in the future. I mean, did Abraham not totally get this? 
Hebrews 11, 8 to 10. Look what Abraham says. By faith, or not Abraham says, reminding us of Abraham. Abraham obeyed when he was called out of the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was to go. For he waited for the city which has its foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Talking about Abraham, when God told him to go, he didn't know where, God just sent him. But he knew that sometime, that somewhere there was a city out there, its builder was God. We press toward that goal, eternity, that we might rest in him, rest and press. They would look through the, the roof of, of, of the hole in their tabernacles, in the heavens reminding them, there is a city built by God for me. They would celebrate in their rest and press toward the heaven that was above and waiting for them, whose city was builder and maker is God. And all these feasts, that, that's the meaning of the feast, all these feasts teach about Jesus, who was the ultimate tabernacle, the dwelling place of God on earth, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus fulfills all these feasts. Number one, the second coming. The end of the world, when those that follow Christ have that chance to enter into that city where the builder and maker is God. Until then, we have rest for our soul. No matter what we are going through living with, Jesus comes along and says, I am your rest as you press forward. I am your rest when you're grieving because someone died. I am your rest because this is going to be a bad Christmas because there's someone in your life or family that died and they're not with you this Christmas. That first Christmas is tough. I am still your rest. I am your rest when you got a physical report you didn't figure on. I am your rest when you're bleeding financially. I am your rest. Really? Look what he said. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. One of my favorite verses. Jesus is speaking. Come to me, o all who are weary and heavy laden. That means heavy laden, I'm burdened. I can't hardly breathe. I'm suffocating. If that's you, come to me and I will give you rest. If we stop there, the verse makes no sense. Doesn't it, really? If you're hurting and you take a nap, have you solved anything, really? If he's always giving us his rest when we're bleeding, he doesn't help me. It's the next verse this thing, this thing pops. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. He's talking to farmers. That, that verse, you kind of have to put in context of who he's talking to. There, there's a great old sentence in, in terms of teaching communication. Have a clue who you're talking to. Nobody was better than that than Jesus. He's talking to shepherds. He says, you know, you guys, when you got 100 sheep and you count 99, what do you do? Shepherds got that. He's talking to fishermen. He's saying, you know, when you're mending your nets, those guys got that. Now he's talking to farmers. He always seemed to talk in the language that people seem to really grasp. He's talking to farmers. He's saying, when you can't carry the load, when you're grieving too much, bleeding too much, hurting too much, I will yoke with you. Boom, those farmers would get that. Because they would put two oxen together. They would call it yoking them. Maybe we still do that today. They would yoke them to where they'd almost be shoulder to shoulder. And they'd teach them to work in harmony. To where the load that one oxen could not carry, the two of them could. Jesus is saying, where you're hurting and bleeding, I will give you rest. I'll partner with you. Look what he does not say. He doesn't say, I'll make the load go away. Just because you come to Christ doesn't mean you tiptoe through the tulips all your life. You still have loads. You still get hurt. You're still a human being. You're not a robot. You come to Christ. He comes along and says, when that load hits you, when it's more than you can bear, why on earth would you carry it alone? I am your rest. I will yoke with you. I'm not going to make it disappear, but now I will partner with you. I will get you through the grief. I will get you through the hurt. I will get you through the disappointments. I will get you through whatever you're bleeding over because I will yoke with you. I am your rest. It becomes very powerful. He becomes the tabernacle of rest. And then he makes clear we can only find this rest through him. I, I see people all around us who are breaking down. Well, they should. That was kind. Merry Christmas. Logically, they should. People without Christ spend their life carrying loads they were never designed to carry in the first place. Without Christ, you end up carrying loads alone. You were never designed to carry them alone. That's why Jesus said, I'll yoke with you. People who without Christ, I see them breaking because they should. Not because they're weak, not because they're lesser. It's because without Christ, who are they yoking with? They're carrying the load all by themselves. 
And Jesus makes clear the only way to find rest is through me. I am the rest of the tabernacles. See, Jesus doesn't give us life. He is life. He doesn't give us peace. He is peace. He doesn't give us love. He is love. He is all we need. We can rest in him and grow in him at the very same time. Entering that city where God is the maker. Too many never enter into the tabernacle of rest because they want things from Jesus rather than they want Jesus himself. They want his blessings rather than the one who gives the blessings. He is our rest and he is available to us only as we fully dedicate our life to him. Now, within this feast, the last day of the feast, if you look at all these feasts, they kind of work toward a climax. And there's a big celebration. Everything is amped up. On the last day of the feast, we have issues going on here, that climactic day. And they, of course, point to Jesus. And it's amazing. Remember I said these verses pop when they happen in the feasts? Jesus made dynamic statements in the feasts because the crowd was huge. They understood the feasts. He's got to make some statements here that you're going to go, whoa, it pops. On the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles, it's called the Day of Great Hosanna. I mean, this is a party going on. Now, that Hebrew phrase going to the English is also sometimes translated save us now or deliver us. On that climactic day, the Jews would pray for rain. Also looking at God's salvation through the water of the Messiah. Rain is what, the rainy season is about to happen. Those plows only work if the rain has softened the ground. And so there's a ritual going on. It's it's, it's kind of a physical and and spiritual significance. Part of the ritual, as the rainy season's getting ready to begin, we're praying to soften the ground, offering the ground to the Lord for rain, praying for the significance of living water from the Messiah. A priest would draw water from the Pool of Shalom. In a golden pitcher. He would then present this to the high priest and pour the water into a basin at the foot of the altar. As this is taking place, the people would cheer and celebrate. The Messiah will come who will give us living water. At the same time, we're praying to God and praising him for the rain that will come to, fo- to soften our ground. They would blow trumpets. The people would wave those palm branches. Remember, the, talked about those palm branches while singing praise to the Lord. I mean, We don't need to do too much here. Palm branches, so obviously, Jesus enters Jerusalem and the great day of praise. The loudest praise of all the the feasts is the last day of Feast of Tabernacles when they're waving palm branches. I mean, the connection there, we don't need to elaborate on. It's kind of simple. As they praise, Isaiah even talked about this praise. Isaiah 12, 3 is referring to the Feast of Tabernacles. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. He's referring to this feast. This tradition, you have to realize all these feasts happened while Jesus was walking on earth. Jesus would observe observe the Torah. He would go to these feasts himself. And many times, as I said, it was there at the feasts that he would make grand statements tying it all together. Here's a verse that you've probably heard. In the celebration reached its peak, the last day, the great day, Jesus makes a statement. John, eye, eye witness, ear witness, records it. Talk about this verse all of a sudden coming to life, huh? John, now they just poured the water, the living water. John 37, chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. Look what, look what John heard Jesus say. On the last day, the great day of the feast. I mean, this is the last day of tabernacles. This is the biggie. On that last day, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow waters of living water. Yikes. Is that verse new, huh? Yikes. All of a sudden, that verse that we've heard a thousand times, when we lay it in context of what's going on with the Feast of Tabernacles, It's powerful. Jesus is making that bold statement. Everything that you've celebrated in tabernacles, it's me. I am the living water that you've been been praying for. I am the living water you've been praising God about. I am the living water that has been the highlight of, of the celebration of seven days of celebration. Look to me and be saved now. I am the great Hosanna. I am what the feast has been teaching on. At the high point. I mean, how cool is that? As they're pouring this water, John hears Jesus tell the crowd, I am living water. Now, there's a second ritual. The the last day wraps up at night. And at night, there is this great, really cool grand finale. You have to remember, 
It's the lighting of the temple. Remember, tens of thousands of pilgrims are there. They come to Jerusalem. It's packed with people. And now they carry night torches. They illuminate the city for miles, Josephus, the historian, writes. They would illuminate the city for miles. Imagine thousands of people, typically the men, with torches coming towards the tabernacle. Yeah, how cool is that? Now, this also has a physical and spiritual significance. Along with the rain, they had to have the sunshine for their crops. They're thanking God for the light. And the torches represented light. They've already praised him for the rain. Now they're praising him for the light because it all comes back. We've completed the harvest. So light is obviously the critical thing. And they're looking for the Messiah who would be their light. And in the midst of this, the, the, the ceremony of the torches, how cool is that? All these torches, thousands of them. John hears Jesus proclaim this. One chapter later, just moving up to chapter 8. We're still in the Feast of Tabernacles. John 8, 12. Look what Jesus says. Then Jesus spoke to them again. Again, because he's already spoken. We're in the Feast of Tabernacles. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. Yeah, I know. We've heard that verse a thousand times. But when you lay it on top of the feast, whoa, it's all together new. Jesus is saying, not only am I living water, of the Feast of Tabernacles, come to find out I am the light. I am the light of the world. And this was made at the height of the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus proclaims in a clear way who he is. We praise God. This Advent season, there is rest for our souls now as he yokes with us. He is the light and the rest and the power and the living water. And there is a city being built all tying back to the simplicity of a manger. Bethlehem, the Virgin Mary. See, Jesus didn't just merely die and go to heaven. He is kingdom that you and I have the privilege to live our lives so that this one, the feast, the tabernacles, unleavened bread, trumpets, this one, Passover lamb, we can live kingdom that he receives glory from everything in my life. We walk in his power and we walk in his rest. Face the tabernacles. It all comes together. Let me have a word of prayer with you.